Hello everyone, today we talk about the Second Bulgarian Empire. We made a first video about its rise, now we make one about its fall, then others will follow more in depth. Uh, there is a Medieval Bulgaria playlist that contains already um, several videos. So, um, this sense of rise and fall, of course, uh, comes ex uh, you know, post from the of course, from the fact that uh, we know how the story ended. So, of course, drawing like a sort of um, apex and then deciding where to descend is, is not historically in the given moment so easy. But we can identify this moment of relative crisis starting essentially in the 40s uh, of the 13th century, after which things go substantially downhill, then there is a sort of stabilization at the beginning of the 14th century, and then things basically go uh, downhill definitely from essentially the 40s, the 50s of, of the 14th century for uh, dynamics that from chronologically you understand being connected as usual with especially the latter with the big crisis of of the 14th century, the contraction of power and so on. But naturally, like not all powers ended uh, like this. We have um, introduced this first. Um, you will have the, the link um, to the first part uh, uh, in in the top comment uh, below, so that you can get a bit of bit of, of an introduction, a context uh, of this phase. However, the initial crack begins with the uh, devastating. Uh, attack, a Mong Mongol attack on Poland and Hungary that basically passed uh, throughout the Dalmatia and then uh, the Balkans uh, and therefore crossing uh, Bulgaria before returning to this, the, the Nubian corridor, uh, the, the, the corridor say between the, the, the Black Sea and the Carpathians back to the, uh, to the seat of, of the Golden Horde, right? Um, at this point Bulgaria was aligning itself with the Latins um, as uh, the Bulgarians had initially actually allowed the same Paloyologoi to um, to survive indirectly by crushing the Latins, famously enough, in open field just uh, a few years after the establishment of the same Latin Empire, about which I also made a video, and that we will see in, in detail uh, as far as the military side of the story is also concerned. And now, basically, they were somehow repenting, or at least uh, things could not really be... Um, foreseen before, so at this point the Latins were joined by the Bulgarians against uh, the Nicene dynasty. Right at this point, the Mongols attack. Right, uh, and the uh, Bulgarian leader, even as in the second, even manages to defeat part of their army returning um, to the east after this this devastating uh, raid. Naturally, the situation was not optimal because the Mongols were still crossing Bulgaria, right, uh, and uh, ravaging the territory uh, and so on. But it was, of course, uh, uh, at that point, mostly a condition of, of major force. Uh, as we will see, the Mongol presence would um, would stay, uh, creating uh, even uh, substantial problems, especially with the, the uprising of Ivailo. Right, that we will see was properly a, a, a peasant rebellion against uh, the uh, the emperor and, and the nobility. I'm talking about the Bulgarian emperor. Uh, and um, even as in the second died in 1241, he was succeeded by his son Kaliman I, known also as Kaliman as in the first or Coloman, or Coloman, the spelling with C or K, doesn't matter. However, he was still a child. At his father's death, he was the son of of, a, um, of an Hungarian princess, Anna Maria. And despite the initial success against the um, the Mongols, the regency of um, the the new emperor decided to avoid further raids and chose to pay the Mongols tribute uh, instead. All right? Um, this was dictated mostly by internal political issues, but also the fact that the Mongols were still a force to be reckoned with, and Bulgaria was just the in the immediacy of their, say, projectional capability, as mostly the, the Stamps peoples had been entering uh, the Balkans through 
uh, through this land, right, including St. Bulgars back in the day. Um, so um, a minor um, on, on, on the throne is definitely uh, a problem for, for the country. Uh, there were increasing rivalries among the nobility, uh, which uh, actually corresponded to some well general well-being at least of, of this uh, or reinforcements put in this way of probably the aristocratic like the the, the feudal touch right of, of the aristocrat of the Bulgarian aristocracy considered that the Balkans after the uh, the fourth Crusade had uh, undergone a, a massive privatization feudalization Frankish influence um, etc so this meant that compared to Say the, the the rest of the high middle ages, um, the also the, the Bulgarian nobility was di- becoming ever more dynastic, right, and entrenched in their own local uh, privileges um, to the detriment of the the unity of this always very, um, especially after the, the defeat of of the at, uh, in the eleventh century at the hand uh, of the Byzantines, like a, a very unstable system. Right, we've seen that the the Bulgar the Bulgarians here are substantially mixed with the Kumans, with the with the Vlachs. There is I, I talk about this in the videos about uh, medieval Wallachia, and we will come back to to those probably soon. Um, so it was just mostly a, a cohesion of forces that had managed to exploit the essentially the collapse of the Byzantine state. Uh, but that stemmed fr- mostly from a subjection uh, to to the latter in the previous centuries. So it doesn't matter how autonomous these uh, people had been historically uh, in, um, in in the Balkans uh, from compared to Constantinople. They the say the sense of public culture, the potential, what had been especially the first Bulgarian Empire, about which I made a video too, um, had not been recovered. Right, nor in terms of political compaction, nor in in actual general uh, power, at least in relative terms to the, to the neighbors that had been also existing back in the day. Um, so we can identify already from the time of Kalaman the First this general decline of what the Bulgarians had managed to uh, reestablish after having risen against their former masters. Um, and as such, uh, the uh, Bulgarian main Bulgarian rivals remained the Nicaeans, the Palaiologoi, right? Uh, that were advantaged by the, the situation, you know, that they had been re- reconquering a substantial amount of land from, from Asia, they, they looked forward to, to properly retake control of Constantinople and thus Re- restoring what remained fundamentally of the Byzantine Empire, and especially they had not been uh, impacted by the Mongol invasions because these had mostly struck Central Europe, the Balkans, but they had not reached fundamentally the what had been left of the Byzantine domains, at least especially in the Asian part, in the Nicene part. Uh, so at the weakening of the Bulgarians, for all these reasons, the Nicene's rose. Right to, to greater power, and of course, mostly on the same basis that had been the, the historically Byzantine one. So the the coastal, essentially the Greek coastal centers of of, of the Aegean, right? And so this broader culture that existed from from millennia, uh, the fact that it was very very different from the one of of the uh, Balkan interland, uh, and which had posed, in fact, problems exactly in this way. I mean, the Bulgarian power was based fundamentally on, on, on this difficulty in subjugates historically like the Balkan interland, right, to maintain uh, uh, direct control of these areas, uh, terrible grounds, uh, n- true nightmares as far as ambushes, um, raids, um, a scorched earth um, strategy is concerned, right, so um, this is the same reason somebody asked me the other day among the comments uh, the, in the comments like why didn't the, the Byzantines ever you know after they crashed the Bulgarians in the 11th century that they, they didn't take over like everything in the north even up to the Carpathians yeah like with, with, a, with an 11th 12th century 
power, like to invest in that area for for what, right? With which cost benefit uh, ratio? Those, those weren't those aren't historically areas where you can expect because they are not as developed, first of all, as the Byzantine ones. There are admittedly at some point mineral resources and all that, but there are much richer more developed um, and also threatening and powerful lands all around in the Mediterranean before you think to secure uh, those places. You know that even the, the same uh, Bulgar Octonus, Basil II, of course left for, for obvious reasons, right, the, the Bulgarians with, with, a, with a substantial autonomy because um, it, it really didn't make sense to handle them in, in any different way um, at that point. Just cutting the hell out with the, the broader empire was broken right and so reduced to to a much milder subject than it had been uh, before now uh Kaliman the the first uh died probably poisoned at 12 years old in 1246 uh so this created further problems because there would be several other several short reign rulers that just made the government weakness uh, rise uh, even more. And the Nicaeans um, actually taking advantage of this, uh, reconquering large amounts in, uh, of territory in southern Thrace, the Rhodopes, uh, and Macedonia. We're talking about uh, important centers such as Adrianople, historically um, the, the gate uh, from, from Europe to to, to, to Constantinople, Tsepina, Stanimaka, Melnik, Ceres, Skopje, and Orid. That was very easy to do, actually. There was a very little resistance put up. It was, um, uh, again, a matter mostly of lack of, of garrisons, also general uh, sentiment of the the population. If you wanted to, to oppose the Nicaeans that were coming like with an actual field army, right, you, you had to put together one yourself and facing them and potentially putting in, in danger, like, the, the, the and significantly that the further uh, instability of, of, of the, of the, of the empire, uh, in a moment which the latter, as we've seen, is, is thrown in, in turmoil. And, and these events do not help either. Consider that Hungary at this point was also taking advantage of Bulgarian Weakness so much so they occupied Belgrade and Branicevo. So that the most important, um, say, uh, this is Belgrade, obviously, but also Branicevo, one of the most important um, fortresses in, in, in the region, right? The, the key, uh, these are the keys to, to the middle Danube, um, and uh, so putting a substantial pressure to the Bulgarians uh, from the northwest when lost. Right, um, the Bulgarians were um, stunned by this. Uh, they they remained uh, paralyzed, um, incapable of reacting, um, until seven years later. Right, then only only after seven years, the Bulgarians put together an army on their own, and they invaded Serbia, regaining the raw dopes the, the following year. By the way, so reasserting like sort of at least showing off saying like we we are we still got it right we're still functional we can still bite however the uh ruler michael the second as uh indecisiveness uh allowed the nicaeans still to regain other uh lost territory including the one here that the one that the bulgarians had re uh re temporarily retaken again back in, uh, from them, with the exception of the aforementioned Sepina. In 1255, Bulgaria managed to reassert control of Macedonia. Uh, for mostly the, the, the local feeling of the inhabitants that were closer to uh, the Bulgarians uh, in general ra rather than the, the Byzantines. Right, uh, the, the Bulgarians ruled from from Tarnovo, that is substantially uh, close to to the same Macedonia, more than like just historically, um, uh, is would would escape most of the, the Byzantine control in the interland under a, a Bulgarian authority. Um, 
the, the Serbians, as we will see, that was an interesting back and forth. They talk about it also in that video about Eastern Balkan warfare, right? But there are very nice local uh, sources about arms and armor that date back mostly to today's uh, video uh, timeline. Um, all Bulgarian gains in this were, however, lost in 1256. So something was really not working the way uh, it should, right? Uh, especially because that process of kind of Bulgaria herself falling apart under the 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 ambition, you can say, of the single local rulers was evidence itself. In fact, Rostislav Mikhailovich, that was actually a, a, a Rus prince dignitary of the kingdom of Hungary. Nicene control over the disputed areas. So basically he uh, shook off a bit of Imperial Bulgarian pressure from his northwestern territories by creating problems um, to, um, to the former in the, in the southeastern frontier w with the Byzantines. Uh, this literally separate, as we will see now, uh, this, this would bring um, to a substantial split of Bulgaria. Like it would be properly a Tsardom of Bidin and one of Tartnova that was the, uh, the imperial capital at this point. But plus you, you have the Bruja that in, in the, on the Black Sea that basically also acts alone. The country is starting to um, fall uh, apart on the base of this different local uh, dynastic allegiances. However, the major uh, setback was uh, the emperor's death, right, uh, and th uh, thus also further civil strifes, instability. Uh, given that there were many claimants to the Bulgarian throne until uh, the next year, 1257, when uh, the boyar of Skopje, that was Constantine um, Tich, right, uh, or Constantine the First Tich, uh, emerged uh, as a victor, uh, he managed to rule for 20 years, uh, interestingly enough. Um, he led uh, the the empire throughout mostly um, a fight against the Byzantines, right? Uh, and given that, as we'll see now, this was suffering of internal stability as well. This was mostly all, all, always uh, the game, like playing on each other's internal problems uh, from the outside, not directly causing them, of course. They were all at each other's throats. In 1257, the Latins, by the way, uh, that were already they were still scattered in the in the Balkan interland, partially attacked and seized Nezebar, Mesembria. Uh, however, that that is on the uh, Bulgarian Black Sea, right? Uh, they they could not hold the town. Uh, there was this general threat coming either from certain surviving. Um, uh, say, the thieves, uh, especially in Greece, but especially the, the coastal dimension, the, the projectional capacity of, of, of the Latins throughout their, their fleets around the Aegean. Like the, notoriously, the, the same Nicaeans were reconquering the empire um, through, uh, by subcontracting parts of it to, to the Genoese, right? We've seen it also in other videos. Um, the most serious situation for Constantine Tick was, however, in the northwest, where um, the Hungarians had supported the aforementioned Rostislav Mihailovich, was basically uh, their guy uh, in uh, Bulgaria, so much so that he had proclaimed, self proclaimed uh, emperor uh, in the same bid, and so es establishing a sort of parallel court uh, to the one of Tarnov. In 1260, uh, Constantine, however, managed to recover Bidin. Even went as far as occupying the Severin Banat, right? But Hungary was more powerful, and uh, the next year, uh, a counterattack forced the Bulgarians to retreat 
to the very third novel, right? And Ross's love was restored to Vaden. So it's as if uh, not really nothing had happened um, because it would be some interesting uh, uh, changes even for, for Ross's love, but still the, the, the sense that Vidit was uh, Vidin was a, a different center now that wasn't playing along with the rest of the country was evident, right? Ross's love um, uh, fell um, the Bulgarian noble uh, Jakob Svetoslav um, uh, rose to 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 the control uh, of Vidin, and by 1266 he had also styled himself Emperor of, of Bulgaria. In the meanwhile, Michael VIII Palaiologos uh, managed to restore the Byzantine Empire. As you know, uh, the, the the Latins lost uh, the capital that uh, had remained. Uh, just uh, the the like isolated right from this other Balkan uh, events right after the so th- the Latin reigns had been broken uh, in the Balkans after substantial amount of generations that uh, tells you like how much could the the rivalry of all the other players do even in uh, letting them controlling the same Constantinople still. Um, Needless to say, the reinstallation of a uh, Byzantine government in Constantinople, the substantial uh, control of uh, the Nicaeans over some of what had been, in fact, the, core, the very core lands of, of previous imperial power in the Aegean, both in Asia and in Europe, worsened significantly the Bulgarian situation. In fact, with the forces that could now be gathered in larger numbers, the Byzantines invaded uh, Bulgaria herself in 1263. They were mostly interested in the coastal towns of Mesembre and Ankylaos, right, uh, that in fact fell into their hands. Uh, some important cities in, in, in the Thracian interland, including Philippopolis, that was um, an, an important one, second most important after Adrianople, um, uh, were, were lost by, by Bulgaria uh, like that. This showed that Constantine Thick was not able to, uh, to respond, at least with his national forces alone. So he convinced, desperately, the Mongol to attack Byzantine Thrace. Right. Now, the, the thing was partially successful for at least the Mongols, because they, they raided, but they raided both Byzantine territory and the same Bulgaria, <laughs> while the, the latter one, they were returning north of the Danube. So showing pretty well that um, the country was just exposed, right? it was open to invasion, the uh, imperial government was uh, significantly... Um, crippled, right, uh, and the same Constantine remained lame after a hunting accident at the beginning of uh, the 60s of the 13th century. Also, uh, he fell apparently under the influence of his wife, um, Maria Paiologina Kanta Kudzen, right, uh, that was in fact the, the emperor's consort of Bulgaria, um, and niece of Michael VIII, uh, Palaiologos, right? Uh, she was a very intriguing uh, woman uh, in many ways. Uh, she fueled divisions among the, the nobility. She was very, very political. And in the meanwhile, the Mongols had proven to be able to raid uh, Bulgaria. That wasn't faring just very well um, uh, by itself as we've seen, which triggered a massive popular uprising, the aforementioned Ivailos I, um, which um, affected mostly the northeast of the country because it was the most exposed to the Golden Horde. Uh, we're, uh, we're talking, however, about a very interesting type of rebellion because normally rebellion would uh, 
be carried out against a constituted power by some substantial uh, nobiliar figure, right? Here instead you have, uh, indeed the area is not particularly stratified. From a social point of view, uh, there were surely some aristocrats joining the rebellion, but um, Ivailo, the, the leader of the same, was a swineherd, right? Um, and his forces were peasant uh, in, in, in nature. In spite of this, he managed to defeat the Mongols on two occasions, which was seen by this traditional peasantry as uh, you know, uh, an enormous deal, uh, imperially wise. So the guy was a sort of, of chosen one, in spite of his lower birth. And this old man was uh, mirrored when he managed to crush the imperial Bulgarian army in battle, killing by his own hands the same Constantine thick, commanding it. Um, this was a huge deal. Uh, also because this swineherd uh, killed the emperor claiming that uh, this had been the outcome as the sovereign had not managed or had properly done nothing to defend his honor. So again, he th this was the scene as, again, he's mostly his passivity, the fact that he had brought the Mongols in, that, as you understand, had triggered this, this rebellion um, in many ways because the peasantry had paid substantially for it that he was under this Byzantine woman um, uh, so you know the, the worst really you can imagine uh, in, in terms of a, a, of a traditional ruler um, uh, and fearing a revolt in Constantinople and willing to exploit the situation Michael VIII uh, thought to send an army led by even Asen the third that was um, one of the many Bulgarian pretenders to, to the throne, so this was the Byzantine guy, before Ivailo and his peasant army could reach Tarnovo, but the Byzantines were beaten in time, and not only. Maria Palaiologina, uh, the emperor's widow, remarried with Ivailo, who was in the process proclaimed emperor. So just imagine the odds, right? You know, and the, uh, let's say, if they had told that, you know, a, a Byzantine princess had been married one day to a, to a swine uh, herd, like, you know, what uh, this would have seemed like. But the, the days of, of the older glory were definitely over, and this seemed, at least for for Maria, a good, um, a good chance, right, to continue her uh, political, uh, to her political fortune. Um, the Byzantines uh, naturally were beaten by this, um, this, uh, this check. Um, but Michael VIII got an idea from his deceased rival and called essentially the Mongols again to harass Bulgaria that at least geographically you know would have not made them pass through the Byzantine territory that however they had already invaded so like the Mongols given their taste for for raiding etc uh, didn't have to make themselves uh, asked uh, twice they invaded the Bruja they crushed Ivailo's army, um, showing that he was not really, you know, that undefeatable ruler that uh, his imperial title would have made him wish. On the contrary, they forced him to retreat to Drastar, uh, in uh, a town in northeastern Bulgaria, just on the southern bank of the lower Danube River where um, he withstood a three-month siege. In the meanwhile, Asen III was um, greeted by the Bulgarian nobility who opened the gates of Tarnovo to him. So basically turning their back to Ivailo, whom they considered like a lesser person, and to some, uh, to some reasonable uh, degree. Um, this 
even as and was as we've seen the 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 Palaiologon guy, right? He was a Bulgarian nobleman, so they still um, Ivail was not uh, defeated, so there was still a, a complicity between these these factions that, of course, didn't like much each other. Nor we had to think about Ivan as a philo Byzantine just per se, right? They were trying everything to come to power in the first place. But you understand how consistently messed up this whole thing really is, especially for, for the count. Um, in any case, uh, in early 12, uh, 1279, Ivailo managed to break off the Mongol siege at Drastar and march to Tarnovo, which he besieged, um, showing that his movement, generally speaking, was still strong because it was about this peasantry playing their, their last card in many ways because between the Bongols and the, the Bulgarian nobility, right, there wasn't... Yeah, admittedly, there was some difference, but um, it's, it's one of those um, movements in which you understand it was probably a social uh, a reason, right, more than a strictly uh, political... Say, a, 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 a vertical divide, just an horizontal one. Um, at this point, the Palaiologans decide to send a 10,000 strong army to relieve uh, even as in the, th- the third uh, and his, his forces. Right. However, they were crushed by Ivailo at the Battle of Devina, uh, close to the modern town of Kolto. Uh, in the Bur- Burgas province in southeastern uh, Bulgaria, right? Uh, so th- this military uh, uh, episodes are, are quite interesting because the um, say so we do not know even too much about the the, the course of of the battle in this case as as others, but uh, it, it was always a bit the same sort. Like the Byzantines being a bit the the heavier kind of uh, they were substantially influenced by western warfare feudalism as well but and so they were not so different from the bulgarians but the 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 the, the places the passages the the sense that every uh, every choke point could be used for for an ambush uh, as it would happen also in this case etc the uh, encircling maneuvers of, of the bulgarians whenever there was enough space um, in open field, this constant attrition. This is typical of, of the Balkan frontier, right? So it was admittedly a serious issue, which would have, um, like this, this uprising that would would have possibly changed uh, uh, something in, in Bulgaria. Not exaggerating, like like a, a peasant revolution or something like that, but still, right? You know, um, triggered some substantial changes, and this people were evidently motivated, because not just they managed to crush this 10,000 strong Byzantine army, but another one of half the same size, right? This uh, last debacle brought the same even as in the third to escape. Um, Yet Ivila's situation was uh, still very difficult, to say the least. Um, The initial... Uh, victories had, uh, however, still kept dragging uh, his forces in in warfare. The initial spirit, like the, the projects, the ambitions of the followers, etc., were, were changing. So the support uh, diminished. The Mongols, by the way, could not quite be stopped. This was the, the main problem. Like, what what could this government really do? Right? It, it takes out some 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 noblemen. But then, like, you cannot dislodge the Golden Horde, nor making Dobruja changing, you know, place on the map to, to avoid the, the nomads to, to always attack on it. Um, admittedly, there could have been some Mongol defeat, right? And as we've seen, the Mongols had actually managed to crush um, Ivailo's um, forces uh, at some point. Um, the nobility wanted to take this guy out, because... They didn't really like him. So what what really happened, which is pretty miserable um, as an end, is that Ivailo sought refuge with his former enemies, uh, the Mongols. Uh, we are at the end of 1280, uh, and that's when he was killed, right at the Mongols' 
uh, you know, under the, the Mongol custody, apparently uh, at the request of the Palaiologoi, right, that he had promised the Mongols something in exchange. So this guy wasn't really quite liked by um, much more than some of his peasant retinues. Um, the, the Bulgarian nobleman at this point decided to uh, elect the, the powerful noble and ruler of the very important political, military and also economic center of Kerben that was um, George I Tertar. Right? Um, he is said to, uh, to be of both Bulgarian and Kuman ancestry, which would explain also uh, the second uh, name, the double name uh, added. However, with poor success, given that the Mongols uh, in actually increased their presence um, in, uh, in the Bulgarian frontier, uh, most of the Bulgarian-held um, places in Trace were uh, lost to the Byzantines. Um, Considered the country had been significantly shattered by all these political upheavals, military um, engagements, ravages, um, general general pessimism regarding the the events. Even um, there was at some point um, in thirteen hundred, even uh, the for a few months, admittedly the rule of Tarnovo by the Mongol Chaka, who reigned, in fact, as Tsar of, of Bulgaria, right between 1299-1300, right? He was the son of the Mongol leader Nogai Khan himself, right? So this this tells you the, the degree of, uh, of influence the Mongols exercised what appeared now as a sort of client state uh, of theirs. However, it was also labile, uh, control because it was significantly uh, decentralized. Um, in the year 1300, Theodor Svetoslav, um, uh, that was the son of the aforementioned George I Tertar, exploited a civil war uh, b- broken out uh, in the Golden Horde to overthrow Chaka and actually presenting his head to the rival Mongol Khan, Tokta, the son of Mengu Timur, and the grandson of Batu Khan. Uh, this produced an interesting uh, result, because the Golden Horde uh, now found some rest, because this, this death had stabilized uh, a bit the situation, and the country had to recover on its own. Uh, the action of Theodore were recognized right, in, in a conveniently and friendly fashion so that the Mongol influence in Bulgarian internal affairs um, was substantially uh, diluted, to say the least. Conversely, the Bulgarians managed to exert uh, a strong influence on southern Bessarabia, uh, the Bujak, um, as far as Bulgrad, that was you know historically known as Ackerman uh, or by other names, it's it's a municipality in port in the Odessa Oblast in southwestern Ukraine. It's a a very strategic um, fortification located on the right bank of the Dniester estuary, leading to to the Black Sea. So I talk about it mostly in the video about medieval Moldavia, right? Um, and the this brought naturally to, to the Bulgarians a substantial amount of income. Like the, the, the matter of the, of the Golden Horde here is always connected to the actual uh, capacity of st- strategic projection that they could um, perform from their, um, say, oil f- fields, right, from their, from their pastures north, north of the Caucasus. So um, there was not a direct continuity. There were other nomadic peoples there that were a bit harassing everybody involved, but there were just like a few compared to 
instead the, the, the substantially strong Golden Horde forces that had also other in, more interesting enemies, let's put it in this way, um, to to check uh, in much closer places than, than Bulgaria. Uh, so we can identify, a, a, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, a phase of temporary stabilization uh, of Bulgaria, a bit like um, uh, the, the, that summer, let's say, um, in which the um, new uh, the, the new emperor Theodor Svetoslav um, afforded at least you know the, the resources to rebuild in part his country's um, stability, uh, the the economy, like the, of course re reaffirming that the uh, the regularity of the agrarian uh, production, the also just making the country safer for trade to cross uh, it uh, again. Naturally, all this passed through a policy of force which brought some semi-independent Bulgarian noblemen down uh, militarily. Uh, there were some traitors executed, especially those who had uh, assisted the Mongols in the past, notably including the uh, patriarch of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, Joachim III. Mm -hmm. uh, in all this, the Palaiologans were plotting against uh, Bulgaria, continuously uh, counting on on the, the local instability. As we've seen, uh, there had been already pretenders backed by by Constantinople with also military support. Theodor uh, Svetoslav's um, uh, uncle, Aldemir, the despot of Kran, that is a town in, in the center of Bulgaria, crushed uh, some other Byzantine attempts of coup, right, properly defeating uh, the forces that were, were sent. So, still showing that, of course, uh, you could capitalize on this political and strategic success to temporarily um, rebuild a consistent authority, order, stability, uh, etc. So much so that between 1303 and uh, 04, the Bulgarians launched several campaigns against the Byzantine Empire, retaking many towns in northeastern Thrace. The obvious purpose was to extend uh, the, the frontier south as to create some buffer states that would stabilize further the, the interland, uh, the Bulgarian interland. The Byzantines managed to stem the Bulgarian advance for a while, but the Bulgarians offended them uh, and crushed them um, remarkably at the Battle of Scafida, which saw this, uh, like, literally a, a double envelopment uh, maneuver, uh, seemingly that the Byzantines lost something between five, six thousand men. Also, the, the Bulgarians suffered an important amount of losses, but it was um, a major victory. That couldn't change the like the cards um, on the broader uh, board. The two countries couldn't quite take each other out. This was the, the secular problem <laughs> between the Bulgarians and the Byzantines. There was no way to, to erase one another uh, politically, culturally, you know, simply like that. Um, as a consequence, uh, the uh, Palaiologoi were uh, forced to make peace with Bulgaria in 1307, acknowledging the enemy gains. Um, so this brought a substantial amount of glory to Theodor Svetoslav, who succeeded, unlike um, other rulers, like most other rulers uh, at the time, to um, to leave a, a peaceful reign um, uh, for the rest uh, of his time. He also 
uh, had cordial relations with uh, the the neighbors in general, especially with Serbia. In fact, in 1318, uh, the Serbian ruler Stefan Roš II Milutin, known as the Saint King, paid even a visit to the Bulgarian capital, Tarnov. Um, this this was a reassuring thing because we will see actually Serbian power will grow uh, to 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 worry the Bulgarians and not only in the following decades uh, substantially, but it was a way also to to safeguard the Western frontier. Um, we will see this also in, in the videos about medieval Serbia. Um, so the economy gradually recovered as much as commerce. Uh, Bulgaria at this point mostly exported large amounts of wheat together with um, other agricultural commodities. So a, a simple economy, uh, but one that could, uh, at least on this regional scale, export um, a substantial amount of you know, primary, uh, primary good. During the 20s of the 14th century, new tensions rose between Bulgaria and the Byzantines again. It was uh, the, the latter, this time, to uh, descend into a civil war. And this was exploited, as always, by the Bulgarians for seizing Philippopolis. Right? Uh, we are, this time, under the reign of the Tsar George Tertur II. Uh, this was again always the, the same thing, controlling the continental interland meant to mostly always be this uh, Damocles sword on the Byzantine coastal uh, valleys um, that could simply be attacked from from upstream, like you, you don't really know where because there are the mountains, the forest uh, in the north um, and causing significant damage while uh, the imperials are, are killing each other for their own, their own reasons. Uh, Bulgaria, however, found uh, herself suddenly in turmoil when George II died unexpectedly in 1322, especially without having left a successor. Right, so it was this time the Byzantines turn to ravage uh, the opponent as they seized um, other Bulgarian held um, towns in northern uh, Trace including the same uh, Philippopolis uh, that as we've seen had just been recovered by the, by the Bulgarians. The Bulgarian nobility elected as the new emperor the energic despot of Vidin, Michael Shishman, uh, who uh, immediately um, turned on the Byzantine emperor Andronikos III, Palaiologos, regaining uh, the lost lands. Right, so that two years later the two rulers signed a peace treaty, uh, which was reinforced by the marriage between the Bulgarian Emperor and Theodora Palaiologina. This change in Bulgarian-Byzantine relations can be interpreted through the warring uh, rise of Serbia for both uh, powers. Michael Shishman divorced his Serbian wife Anna Neda for marrying uh, Theodora Palaiologina. Um, the Serbians were penetrating at this point into Macedonia, so this this land that was historically like a bit in between um, the two uh, the two countries. Um, so warring specifically uh, Bulgaria, like the Serbians at this point were mostly um, expanding towards the south, uh, notoriously. So it was not their specific interest to to crush Bulgaria. It was say, on another axis. However, the simple expansion towards uh, the Aegean, the Thessaly, etc., worried everybody involved because such a powerful, uh, uh, as it's called, Serbian Empire, um, historiographically 
I would have surely on the longer run compromised uh, a bit the, the entire regional uh, balance, where you can argue that if the Ottomans had not uh, basically stood in the way, this entire region after centuries would have been hegemonized by, by Serbian power that was instead uh, denied um, by, the, by the Ottoman victory. Um, so Bulgarians and, and Byzantines began this early to um, campaign against Serbia jointly. Right. Uh, this was not an easy thing to do because, aside from the the strictly military task, uh, there were the historical uh, differences and tensions and distrust between the Bulgarians and the Byzantines to overcome first. Right. Literally, peoples that had been fighting against each other constantly and that still basically had unsettled matters, uh, as we've seen in this quite precarious balance. Uh, they just got together because of mutual interest um, against a, uh, a rise in power. Now, Michael Schisman gathered 15,000 troops and invaded Serbia. Right, He fought against the Serbian king Stephen um, Uroš III, also known as Stephen of the, the Tsani, who uh, probably commanded uh, a comparable uh, uh, amount of force uh, near the, the the engagement was in, in the, the border town of El Baj um, and the armies confronted each other f for a while because they were uh, both expecting reinforcements the Bulgarians for, from, from the Byzantines they agreed to a, a, a one day uh, truce right um, and the Catalan uh, detachment that was arriving uh, in favor of the Serbians under the, the same king's son, uh, Stephen Dushan, uh, Stefan Roche the Fourth, Dushan, Dushan the Mai, right? Uh, uh, the um, uh, the Serbians themselves broke their word right, of the agreement and engaged and defeated. The Bulgarians uh, in the in the Battle of the Baj, where Michael Shishban was killed, right. In spite of this, as we were saying before, the, the Serbians didn't really intend to invade Bulgaria. Like it was just too much of a big thing. Mostly, again, it's it's always from from this Balkan perspective going towards the south, running a, 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 along the valleys and reaching Greece uh, and, and raiding as hell and seizing castles and so on, right? Attacking yet another Balkan country just per se is, is pretty complicated unless, you know, there's not some overwhelming capacity like in this case um, on the longer run even with appears with other places, but it, it's always very complicated to maintain uh, a stable control in this, in this frontier. Um, so... Bulgaria and Serbia made peace, uh, and as a result, even Stephen, the um, the old son of the that Tsar, by his previous Serbian wife, remember Anna Neda, succeeded him in Tarnovos, which mirrors the like the the adjustment of policy, like to say, you know, that now um, it's still not just your 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 son, but a half Serbian one that rules in the legitimate Bulgarian capital, right? Albite, exactly because, because, of course, the Bulgarians had been crushed, but the nobility didn't like this guy uh, in charge, and they overthrew him. Um, so, at, at least as far as domestic policy, they, they could oppose themselves to the Serbians that, as we observed, had not would have not just ventured, they would have not gone boots on Bulgarian ground um, just for... Uh, for him. As a consequence, Bulgaria wouldn't even lose territory after the, the Battle of Veldbach. Uh, at the same time, however, the Serbians continued to expand in Macedonia, which was also proof that uh, the Bulgarians couldn't quite uh, offend the Serbians in their, uh, in their own backyard uh, either. Uh, the 
Bulgarian disaster of well, Baj. I mean, uh, the the Tsar had died, but so it, it's a mess. The, the Byzantines, what did they do? Guess guess what? They attacked Bulgaria, and they seized um, a number of towns and castles in northern Thrace, this tormented frontier. Uh, the tides turned once again in 1332 because the new Bulgarian Tsar Ivan Alexander um, defeated. Uh, the imperial forces at the Battle of Russo Castro, another battle in which, again, the, the Bulgarians um, enacted uh, a flank attack uh, from the from from the right uh, from their right. More than ten years later, uh, in the occurrence of the Byzantine Civil War, uh, also known as the Second Palaiologan Civil War, 1341-47. Uh, the Bulgarians sided with uh, John V, Palaiologus, against uh, John VI Cantacuzenus, managing to capture, in 1344, nine towns along the Maritza River and in the Rodope Mountains, including Filipopolis. With this, we can assess the last um, substantial medieval Bulgarian territorial acquisition that um, unironically and, and sadly enough also uh, triggered the first Ottoman uh, attack to Bulgarian soil because in the meanwhile the, the Turks were entering Europe and seizing this opportunity themselves uh, to to secure some local uh, possessions so because they were supporting uh, the, uh, the the opponents in the civil war, like John the Sixth uh, specifically. So um, that's when Bul the Second Bulgarian Empire comes uh, undone, practically. Um, I made again multiple videos about medieval Bulgaria that also point out many indicators of the fact that in spite of you know keeping herself together that the historically culturally etc this country was relatively fragile from a political point of view and so um, the the Ottomans didn't have much uh, of a difficult time uh, taking over this land that would be, say, the broader Romania together with, with other neighboring countries, like in, as, a, as an Ottoman uh, province. Uh, the Tsar Ivan Alexander tried to mm, repel the Turks in the late 40s and the early 50s, but he failed, right? And it's uh, likely, or at least possible, that his eldest son and successor Michael Azen IV, as well as his second son even Azen IV, may have died uh, in combat against the Ottomans during such uh, operations. Right. Um, plus, even Alexander's relation with his other son, even Stratzmer, um, who had been ruling from Vidin, so this uh, center that basically constituted a bit of one third of, of Bulgaria uh, with its district, uh, had already deteriorated after uh, 1349. Right, and part of, of the reason was that the Tsar had divorced his wife to marry Sarah Theodora, that was a converted Jew. So when their child, Ivan Shishman, was designated as an heir to the throne, even Stratzmir uh, said no and basically proclaimed the, say at least the, the self-standing of uh, Vidin, that would thus basically just be be on its own. Um, and, but we're talking at this point, uh, in the plague had hit, the country, it, it, it's really a messed up situation, right? So the system is exhausted and this uh, disgregation and autonomization of local powers was just taking place um, by itself, we can say. In, again, in an exhausted land. In 1366, uh, even Alexander refused to grant passage 
uh, through Bulgaria to the Byzantine Emperor John V, Palaiologus, and the troops um, uh, that made up the Savoyard Crusade. This was uh, an expedition to the Balkans, in, the, in fact, in those years, 66-67. Uh, led by the Count Amadeus VI of, of Savoy. Wu took this as a hostile stance and basically forced his way through uh, Bulgaria, attacking uh, the Black Sea coast, uh, Amman posts uh, of the Tsar. Uh, the Savoyards seized Sozopolis, Mesembria, Ancalus, and Emona. By the way, causing very heavy uh, casualties. Um, and stopping in front of Varna, who was unsuccessfully uh, besieged. Um, so later on, the Bulgarians decide to grant passage to John V, um, but uh, the lost towns were handed over to, to the Byzantines, so still this, this evidence the, um, the general weakness at this point. Of Bulgarian power to the northwest, um, the Hungarians were also uh, taking advantage of this. In, uh, in fact, they attacked and occupied Vidin in 1365, um, so bringing it to what they called it, the Banate of Bulgaria. Uh, we are at the time of Louis the First of Hungary. The occupation lasted only four years, but it was significant. Um, even Alexander would retake this territory back, in fact, um, supported by uh, Vladislav I of Wallachia and uh, the Bratitsa. Um, uh, the latter was a Bulgarian nobleman, and these two were the Eura vassals of Bulgaria. At least the, the, the Vlachs, as we've seen in, in the video about the origin of Wallachia, etc., were mostly trying to escape the Hungarian pressure. Um, and they had uh, th this entire land, as we were saying in the beginning, was called by also the um, like the, the foreigners, etc., sort of black Kuman Bulgarian power of some sort, right? They, of course, there were different peoples, but there was also substantial, you know, um, proximity, and uh, they they acted um, jointly. The Tsar Ivan Alexander died in 1371, which brought uh, the situation to rapidly uh, deteriorate in terms of political territorial unity. Um, the uh, even uh, the the uh, even Shishman uh, was uh, taking control of Tarnovo. Even uh, Stratzimir uh, maintained control of Vidin even after all the the issues that as we've seen, had invested the place. Uh, and uh, Dobrotitsa, uh, the aforementioned nobleman in Karvuna, in, and so in Dobrut. Um, so this, um, this, this Bulgaria at this point was divided in three places uh, in, uh, in practice, right? Um, the 14th century German traveler Johann Schildberger describes um, literally these lands as three different countries, right? Uh, saying they all call themselves Bulgaria. Um, the first one that you encounter crossing the Iron Gate from Hungary um, is uh, has its capital bid and the other one lies opposite to Wallachia, so from the other side of the Danube, the capital is Tartan, so this was the, say, the, the, the bigger chunk. Um, and the other is uh, the Bulgaria um, uh, of uh, let's say they the are in fact of, of the Danube Delta, right uh, on on the Black Sea, with the capital of Kaliakra. Um, on, on September the twenty sixth, thirteen seventy one, the Ottomans defeated a large army led by the Serbian brothers uh, Vukashin and uh, Jovan uh, Mirnacevic in the Battle of Chernomen, uh, where the Turks lost uh, a substantial amount of forces, but after which they were still able to, uh, well, first of all, to win, but to immediately turn on Bulgaria. But they thought really was an easy counter. You, you see, also, 
I made a video about medieval uh, Balkan heraldry that shows how while other countries uh, in the region were just consolidating, uh, even though everything was not really in the full Western feudal style, because historically this lands had at best had Pernoia in Byzantine times, etc., but there was an ever stronger Western influence, right? Uh, especially, well, of course, in Hungary, it's not Balkans technically, but also in Serbia, etc. Um, and you see the coat of arms, etc., much better outlined, uh, say, more uniform, that we, we do not know excessively much, as it's normal for these times and places, but Comparatively, Bulgaria stands out for being kind of the least codified in this regard. I mean, it, its nobility had been, as we've seen, mixed also with some nomadic elements um, in, in recent times. It was a bit of really a much more private and uh, loose kind of uh, environment. And so, um, also the, the possibility, say, of uh, um, tracing the heraldry uh, is very low to the point of showing us how probably less consistent the same military um, cohesion of the country really was. Uh, the Ottomans basically take over in this invasion the Northern Trace, the Rodopes, Kosanets, Hitman, Samokov. Um, so the, the rule of the Bulgarian Tsar, even Shishman, uh, is limited to the land north of the Balkan Mountains and the Valley of Sofia. That was also now, as we'll see, uh, an object of content between the same Bulgarians. That is to say, you know, the Ottomans are invading you. What, what do you do? Well, you fight against each other. Of course, um, you ha you got to understand the situation as well. Of course, uh, these people realize that things would have not evolved in such a pleasant way, but they still thought that it would have had a, a room, a place, right in this. Say, even in, under the Ottoman influence and. Uh, and um, and rule in the first place, so they would simply exploit like uh, this blows to to ravage on each other's territory. Um, uh, the Tsar Ivan Shishman becomes an Ottoman vassal, by the way, which was also his way to secure his own position. In turn, he recovered even some of the lost towns, right, and secured ten years of an easy peace, which for the time was still a big deal, right, you know, and, and could still, because the Ottomans didn't want this land to be uh, just split in 3,000 pieces that they couldn't quite, um, they had to, just, they knew that they wouldn't immediately occupy directly the entire country, so they just wanted it to be quiet, right, so a, a vassal that still has some consistent control within uh, the uh, the region, so that uh, there are no surprises for the Ottomans, and even if the, the Bulgarians had rebelled, like at least you you would crush one guy, and uh, yes, at that point maybe causing a fragmentation, but surely making everybody aware that that was a worse scenario. Um, the situation was that unstable because also the Ottomans legitimately didn't give a damn. Uh, about these places in uh, terms of long-term um, um, stability for the moment, right? They had other issues. The Ottomans weren't really secure in their conquest and territorial acquisitions for up to very late in time. So at this point, they were just raiding a lot, asserting this uh, control, uh, and uh, Bulgaria was raided, uh, again, starting from the early 80s, which brought to the fall of Sofia. At the same time, even Shishman had been fighting against the Wallachians that had been consolidating some power over time. This war had broken out in 1384. Uh, we have an information from the uh, anonymous Bulgarian chronicle uh, which is actually a sum of various uh, chronicles written in Bulgaria during the Middle Ages and started sometime in, in, in the 12th, but most of them refer to the early 15th, um, states that, that uh, the uh, voivode Dan I of Wallachia, the son of Radu, uh, was killed by Ivan Shishman. 
in uh, in September 1386. All right, uh, and uh, there is uh, a connection, by the way, between uh, these uh, hairs, right? Even Shishman, even Strathmere. Uh, remember these chunks that have formed now. Uh, the the latter ruler had basically abandoned Tarnovo to to her fate in, since 1371. He had even separated the diocese of Biden from the one uh, from the, the Tarnovo patriarchate, right? So properly severing the ties, saying, "Okay, well, I'm just another leader of the Balkans. I'm um, among the others. I'm Bulgarian, whatever, but." I'm trying simply to carve a uh, principality out here on my own. Uh, as a consequence, uh, the Bulgarians were split. They wouldn't cooperate against the Turkish invasion. Uh, it is believed that the main object of content was the aforementioned Sofia, that, as we've seen in this way, fell to the Ottomans in the first place. Um, Shishman um, re reneged on his ballast obligations to support the, the Turks during their campaigns. Um, instead, he used every chance to uh, join in crusading coalitions with the Serbs, the Hungarians, to provoke massive Turkish uh, offensive in, in 1388 and 1393. Uh, on these occasions, the Ottomans met uh, a strong resistance, right? Towns and fortresses didn't want to to give up because they knew that the Turks were not exactly very uh, very tender souled people to say the least and especially all the, the scum of the earth that they were collecting even from more far away places um, so a bit reminiscent of, of the Mongols uh, that uh, as we've seen had created problems to the country back in the day um, but there was not really much at this point that Bulgaria could do against the Ottoman force as a whole, right? So, um, uh, in 1388, you had this first campaign. Then, five years later, Tarnovo herself, after a three-month siege, is captured by the Ottomans. So, this is the main blow, as I understand, to, to Bulgaria as a whole, because uh, it's a loss, right? The, the main uh, city is Turkish. Uh, even Shishman died, by the way, a couple of years later. Uh, when the Turks, led by the Sultan Bayezid I, the Thunderbolt, took um, his last fortress uh, in Nicopol, right, uh, in, on the right bank of the Danube, four kilometers downstream from the confluence with the Oz um, Ozam River, like basically the last Ammon post of, of at least even. Um, in 1396, even Strathmere joined uh, the crusade of Nicopolis, uh, led by the, uh, the Hungarian king Sigismund. However, you know how it ended, right? Nicopolis is the name of the, the defeat that the, uh, the crusaders suffered at the hand of, of the Turks, who immediately after the victory marched on Bidin as well, so probably in the westernmost, like they had seized the entire Bulgaria, um, which ends effectively in the process as a medieval state, right? So um, naturally, the Ottomans suffered a bit the same problems that the Byzantines had in controlling this territory. They were a fresher force; they were also more more brutal um, in in many ways. Um, uh, there are uh, rebellions. There are at least there is a resistance carried out by some interesting figures. Um, for example, Constantine and Frugin, which lasted until 1422. This uh, was uh, an interesting uh, movement because uh, they received support by the the Balakians, the Hungarians. But the, the land itself was already lost, occupied by, by the Ottomans uh, entirely. Um, Constantine, uh, that was uh, recognized still as uh, Tsar of Bulgaria in Vidin from 1397 until um, 
his uh, death uh, in exile at the Serbian court, by the way, in 1422, um, meaningfully about his, his the fate of the, this uh, revolt in the first place, was referred to by King Sigismund as the distinguished Constantine, glorious emperor of Bulgaria. This was just a nicety to say, okay, well, you know, we, we fought against you as, uh, as long as you existed, but, you know, and now that you are, let's say, an Ottoman subject, we will recognize whatever title you, you prefer. At least, you know, as we've seen, there had been some imperial recognitions by the same of the Hungarians for full uh, Bulgaria and rulers that were just opposing Ternovo, so effectively participating to the disgregation. Uh, of the country, at least in in, in a in a long term per, say ex post perspective. Um, so this is basically it. Now, when I make these videos, I always intend these as literally just very short introduction because it, it's a huge like I made so many videos by now, and when I realized that they have made so few about important entities like uh, the Second Bulgarian Empire, etc. Well, I realize there is something wrong, like I have at least to do more uh, in general, right? Not because, you know, I give, I try to give some importance uh, to, to everything, like that, according to certain criteria. But it's obvious that there is uh, an element of random chance so surely we will make other videos about the second bulgarian empire its military organization single battles etc for obvious reasons and this just has to to occur because uh, i literally roll the dice to see what is going to come next and i um, uh, you know i hope that we will get into this stuff further soon for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.